welcome to Peninsula Seniors Out and About. We're at the Western Museum of Flight in Torrance. Let's go see what Cindy has for us today. And now for the piece de resistance. Grant Bagley is Director of Mission Systems Integration and System of Systems Integration for Raytheon Space and Airborne Systems. Grant's career has included assignments of significant leadership in the area of unmanned airborne systems at Lockheed Martin and with the U.S. government. Captain Begley served in the U.S. Navy for 26 years, including operational assignments, flying fighter aircraft, development of next generation weapon systems, and joint assignments. We'll let, we'll let Grant tell us more about himself and how it felt to cross the line of death. Thank you, Grant. I am delighted to be here today and welcome to the Western Museum of Flight. Thank you very much, Cindy. For those of you that aren't members, I encourage your membership or be contributors. If you haven't had the opportunity to walk through the museum, see some of the displays here, uh, being in the South Bay area, and I would offer the hub of aerospace and aviation history, there are artifacts here that are absolutely time sake. And so please take the opportunity after the lecture, see what's at the museum, considering to join and uh, join other future lecture opportunities. So today, my four-hour lecture, <laughs> uh, if you are paying attention, is crossing the line of death. Uh, before I begin, I'll introduce who I am Grant Begley today. If you look at the slide, it says Grant Begley, April 1986. I'm going to take you back in time, take you back to the line of death. I'll take you back even further during this lecture to the birth of the line of death, if you don't know what the line of death was. And it is past tense. The line of death met its demise in 1986. And I will talk about the demise of the line of death. So Grant Begley today. Cindy gave you a quick background of who I am. I am Grant Begley, Captain, United States Navy retired, served 26 years in service, thousands of hours of fighter time, hundreds of carrier landings, combat time, and also had the opportunity with a couple of you in this room to have had the opportunity to do the upgrade of the F-14 into the advanced Tomcat and then also advance other weapon systems. So that's the Grant Begley of today. I'll take you to the Grant Begley of 1986. At that time, Lieutenant Commander Grant Begley, assigned to VF-33 on the USS America, had just departed in February to the Mediterranean country called Libya was becoming a little agitating to U.S. interest and other interest worldwide. So the USS America joined the USS Saratoga, the USS Midway, and the Mediterranean to patrol the Mediterranean and specifically off the coast of Libya. Now for those of you who don't remember 1986, let's go back in time. 1986, what do you remember? A couple of things. Oh, I have an advantage. I knew I was giving this lecture today. 1986, the New England Patriots lost the Super Bowl again. They lost to Chicago. Can you believe that? Statue of Liberty, 100-year anniversary. Your very own Arnold married Maria. Imagine that. Chernobyl, the greatest nuclear disaster yet to mankind. The Challenger disaster. The line of death met its demise. So here's the line of death. Born actually in 1973, met its demise by my assessment in 1986. We will talk about that. So here's the line of death. You see a map of Africa. You see the circle of where Libya is in relationship to Africa. And you see there is no line there. That, that picture of Africa, I offer, is pre-1973, when Libya was a kinder, gentler nation with respect to Western interests. A couple of points of interest with respect to it, Libya. Within Africa, it is the fourth largest country in Africa. It is also the 17th largest country in the world. Libya is a pretty substantial country. Landmass-wise, of Libya, 90% of it is desert. Many of you here in California think that Death Valley holds a record for the highest temperatures in the world. If you go out to Death Valley, they used to claim that, used to publish it. They don't do that anymore. They say one of the highest temperatures in the world. 
Libya holds the record for sustained highest temperatures in the world. Typically in the summer, the temperature goes over 136 degrees in the desert regularly in Libya. The population is pretty poor. Most of the population is along the coast. The people are usually of Muslim belief. It's a rather friendly country, uh, aligned with sort of the Middle East, Northern Africa alignment, and getting along well. No beef with the world. 1968-69, uh, a monarchy. They had a king, a little bit like Egypt. Uh, there was a father and son rivalry. The father was aging and felt as though he could hold the country together for another two years, five years, decade. His son didn't think so. So they were in a bitter battle as to who was going to run the country in 1969. And as a result of that, there was a coup that resulted in the line of death. Muammar Gaddafi was a leader of that bloodless coup. And as you see on the map here, the line of death was established, not concurrent with the coup, but actually in 1973. The Libyan people did not claim a line of death. It was Gaddafi himself. So let's talk about Gaddafi a little bit. Youngest child of a peasant family. Born in the desert, had six older brothers and sisters. Family wasn't of substance, no wealth, but he was able to win acceptance to the Libyan National University and acquire a degree in law. After he achieved his law degree, he went to the Libyan Military Academy, graduated, served a short while in the Army and then was accepted to the very prestigious UK Joint Military College. Graduated from there. Came back to Libya, 67, 68 time frame, and I'll share with you, he had a slightly opposed Western vision at the time. Some people believe it was because of the breakfasts in the UK. I don't believe that myself. <laughs> you are paying attention. So he comes back to Libya as a 26-year-old, 68, in 1969, as a 27-year-old army captain, he leads a bloodless coup and takes leadership of Libya as a 27-year-old. The king that was currently reigning was out of the country. Sounds a little bit like Iran if you go a few years you know, in the future. Uh, the son of the king was rather powerless. The army wasn't really, or the military was not that substantial. So Muammar Gaddafi, with a handful of loyalists as an army captain, was able to conquer, take over the leadership of the 17th largest landmass country in the world. And oh, by the way, Libya was, from a national perspective, a rich country, rich in oil. The people were poor, but the country was rich. The U.S. had presence in Libya at that time. We had airfields in Libya. We were, as with Iran in the 1970s, we're courting the Libyan government, the king. We had presence. We had oil wells. We had airfields. Life was good for America. But Gaddafi was able to accomplish a coup by himself. So as a 27-year-old army captain, realized he had won the leadership of the country, People around him said, well, Momar, what do you want to do now? The most impressive thing that he could think of at the time was promote himself to Army Colonel. And so he took the rank of Army Colonel, not General, didn't take the position of leadership, calling himself King, Dictator. He established himself as Colonel Momar Gaddafi. That was his reward for leading the coup of Libya in 1969. And to date, he still has no other title, no other role. He is not the CEO, not the president, not the king. He refers to himself as Colonel Muammar Gaddafi. People fell in line with him. It was, in fact, a dictatorship. You go into the 1970s, and uh, he's feeling rather bold. Running the country. Realizing how much wealth he really has. He does have an anti-Western line in him, and he realizes in the Cold War environment, he has one of three choices. He can either align himself with America, 
align himself with the Soviet Union or be neutral. He thought the former and the latter were in his best choice, so he began his alignment with the Soviets. Kicked the Americans out. The Americans left on their own in some ways anyhow. Started anti-American and anti-Western politics and rhetoric within Libya. Also realized that America was a very powerful country and he began aligning himself with terrorists the PLO, for example, and other terrorist organizations. So as he goes through the early 70s and being one to reach for power, which is testimony to the coup, he decided also the Gulf of Sidra would be a nice thing to have in his backyard and claim that also. So in 1973, Colonel Muammar Gaddafi declared the line of death the line that you saw in the previous chart, that any plane or aircraft that was not in Libya's interest that crossed the line of death, Libya could use lethal force at their discretion. But when Muammar Gaddafi made that claim, he realized he did not have much lethal force at his presence but he had a lot of wealth. So he began the procurement of some of the most modern arms available at the time from the country, the union that he aligned himself with, the Soviet Union, and began the procurement of the most advanced fighter and tactical jets, as well as a national air defense system. He didn't stop with his procurements there. He made many procurements also from the French to beef up his inventory. The U.S. was a little concerned, as well as the rest of the world, that Muammar Gaddafi established the line of death. And for those of you that are familiar with international law, international waterways, there is a 12-mile limit around nations that is considered sovereign national water passage. I won't get into national law. There's exceptions. But to draw a line between two peninsula that spans nearly 400 miles, according to the UN, according to the US, according to all the other nations, with the exception of Libya, didn't constitute national territorial waters, therefore the line of death was not legal within UN and international law. So the US decided it was probably appropriate, while doing operations in the Mediterranean, to go test the line of death, to cross the line of death to determine whether Libya truly had resolve, not only with respect to the interest of the U.S., but with respect to interest throughout the rest of the world. In 1981, there was the first incident with respect to the line of death. Carrier operations in the Mediterranean near the line of death resulted in the launch of two F-14s. They were on mission. They transitioned south of the line of death and were soon intercepted by two Libyan fighter aircraft. The two Libyan fighter aircraft engaged aggressively. The rules of engagement are such that from a U.S. perspective and at that time we were not authorized to fire unless fired upon. The F-14s, for those of you that aren't familiar, is a, is a wonderful, wonderful jet. In fact, there's one out here on the back side on display at the Western Museum of Flight. The F-14 on board at the time, and even to today, has one of the most powerful air-to-air -air radars. It can detect targets uh, well outside of 100 miles. I don't think it's been declassified yet, so I can't give you the exact range of the F-14 radar, but also the Phoenix missile. And so the F-14 carries Phoenix missiles that can reach out and touch a hostile aircraft well over 100 miles also. But those don't help. If the rules of engagement are you can't fire until fired upon. And the Libyan aircraft had typically short-range missiles, ATOLs, the Russian equivalent of our Sidewinders, heat-seeking missiles. So the Libyan Russian-built aircraft closed in on the F-14s very aggressively. We, the U.S., had the opportunity to monitor, monitor communications uh, pretty well of other military nations. So we have listening devices, we can hear conversations. So we heard 
the conversations, the communications between the ground controllers of the Libyan aircraft as well as the pilots in the aircraft. The Libyans were authorized to engage lethally, but they had not fired. The aircraft pressed in. There are conflicting reports whether a missile came off of one of the Libyan fighters first or not. There's still conflict. But in any case, the two F-14s engaged. The count was Libyans zero, the US two. It was a very short engagement. And that was the first altercation crossing the line of death. A point of interest to the slide, one of the F-14s that was engaged in that engagement, uh, was involved in the engagement, the shoot-down, is in fact up at the Ronald Reagan Library in Smee Valley. And Hank Kleeman was the pilot, and V.J. Benlet was also uh, involved. Hank Kleeman, in fact, a good friend, perished in an F-18 crash at Point Magoo up the coast in the 1980s. Uh, V.J. Benlet is still serving active duty as the uh, the commander, the Naval Air Systems Command right now, and is a good individual. But if you ever get up to the Ronald Reagan Museum, go see the F-14 that was involved. So what happened after that? Ah, tensions heightened. Didn't stop there. Momar was, I believe, a little embarrassed. Realized that he may have not had quite the assets to engage the U.S. military. Was concerned at the strength of the U.S. military continued to procure Soviet weaponry, surface-to-air missiles and aircraft primarily. Expanded his air defense system. Expanded his terrorist activities. Now, in today's environment where there seems to be uh, controversy with respect to claims that the U.S. make on terrorist acts, I would offer that the claims that were made back in the 1970s and 80s were not U.S. unilateral claims that Libya was engaged in terrorist activities. And in fact, the terrorist activities were not directed toward the U.S. specifically. They were directed internationally to Western countries. As you see on the slide, there was a hijacking of TWA Flight 847, 1985. Uh, there was U.S. loss of lives, but there were also other multinationals involved. The Egyptians and other nations tied that event to Libya. There was the Rome and Vienna airport attacks in 1985. I think there were American injuries, but no American loss of lives. There were the European loss of lives. Uh, international determination tied that to Libya. U.S. also claimed that Libya was involved. Libya installs world-class, truly Soviet world-class air defense systems. Remember my comment about the great wealth they had with oil? Well, Muammar Gaddafi felt vulnerable he felt it was in his best interest to use the resources of his nation to protect himself, protect his governance, and also the country. So he purchased fighters, MiG-25s, which at the time were the top of the line Soviet fighters, uh, MiG-23s, which were attack and fighter aircraft, uh, air defense systems, which include the SA-5, top of the line surface-to-air missile, had over 300 launch sites throughout Libya. Interestingly enough, more than two-thirds of them were in the area of Tripoli. Think it was a little self-concerned, self-preserved? I think so. The, uh, is tensions continue to heighten, and the terrorist activities continue to progress. The U.S., at the time Ronald Reagan, saw it as a national interest and probably a good diplomacy step is to freeze Libyan assets in the U.S. at the time. So $2.5 billion worth of Libyan assets were frozen. And we thought that may get Libya's attention. Concurrent with that, the U.S. Navy decided it was probably time to also begin conducting with greater regularity freedom of navigation passages across the line of death. So now we find ourselves 1986. And as I mentioned before, the Carrier America had just joined the Sixth Fleet. The Saratoga was already in theater. The Coral Sea was already in theater. The U.S. chief staffs truly were waiting for the America to join the Sixth Fleet to provide additional firepower. And as a result, in March, we had three aircraft carriers, a battleship, those of you who remember, uh, the Iowa BB-60 was 
uh, reinstated, great firepower. We had cruisers, destroyers, frigates, 30 combatant ships in the area, nearly 225 aircraft for the showdown. Freedom of navigation. And if you can see on the slide, Libya, not much of a naval presence. They had a couple of corvettes, they had some fast patrol boats, but they truly had a formidable air force. And they truly had a formidable air defense system. And even within the Gulf of Sidra, with the SA-5, the SA-5s could reach out and touch an aircraft over 100 miles, a very, very formidable missile. So the showdown had been established. The fleet showed up actually on March 23rd, just north of the line of death. The events of aggression happened on the 25th and the 24th. So on the morning of the 24th, we sent the Ticonderoga, a cruiser, south of the line of death, escorted by F-14s from VF-33. At the same time, a division of F-14s proceeded to the area where we knew there were SA-5 sites. In the progress of the transition of the Ticonderoga over the line of death, the Libyans launched a section of MiG-25s. MiG-25s are very capable. The F-14, as I mentioned before, powerful radar, long-reaching missiles, uh, Mach 2 class fighter, max altitude 50 plus thousand feet. But the MiG-25 is a Mach 3 class aircraft, max altitude over 80,000 feet. Actually, the MiG-25 was developed to engage surveillance aircraft such as the SR-71 and also to be a counter to what was expected to be a U.S. high altitude, high speed supersonic bomber that was never fielded. But the Soviet Union developed the MiG-25, a very capable platform uh, for very high altitude, very high speed engagements. As a platform for speed and altitude and power, awesome. With respect to a weapon system and the ability to engage a Tomcat and win, diminished. Doesn't have the turning capacity, doesn't have the firepower, and Muammar Gaddafi came to realize, even though he had great assets in his inventory, he was lacking something that was critical to success. Trained and willing air crew were missing. The MiG-25s launch, they come out, they engage the F-14s from VF-33, uh, squadron mates of mine, uh, Mike Bucky was the CEO of the squadron at the time, uh, he was one of the F-14s, he had Heim, Heim, Heimgardner was in his back seat, and so as the prior engagement in 81, we knew the MiG-25s were authorized to engage lethally. As they closed very quickly on the F-14s that were escorting to Ticonderoga, the F-14s again were not authorized to fire unless fired upon. The MiGs closed within the range of the MiG-25's weapons, well inside the range of the F-14 weapons. Still no hostile intent. Still we're getting transmission that the MiGs are authorized to engage lethally. They're authorized to fire, but we can't fire until fired upon. One of the MiGs peels off, and in fact, the anticipation is that the MiG was trying to take one of the two F-14s that was in Mike Bucky's section and drag that F-14 into an SA-5, a surface-to-air missile, launch acceptable range. And we knew what the launch acceptable ranges were for the missiles that were along the coast. We knew where the missiles were planted, and we knew where there were areas of vulnerability. One MiG-25 peeled off. The other MiG continued to press in. Mike Bucky requested authorization to fire because he felt as though he was at great threat knowing that his opponent was authorized to fire, but he couldn't return fire until fired upon. Those two aircraft, the one F-14 and the one MiG-25, then began what is traditionally referred to as a dogfight with aggressive maneuvering to try to advantage one or the other's position to fire. 
The F-14's desire at the time was not to allow the MiG-25 a firing opportunity, stay out of the launch acceptable range for the MiG-25's weapons, but still the F-14 didn't have authorization to engage. Mike Bucky again requested authorization to fire. Still no response from the carrier battle group nor the E-2. The MiG-25 ended up clearly in the sights of Mike Bucky as he saddled behind the MiG-25, had a very clear advantageous sh shot, still no authorization to engage. The MiG-25 with more speed, probably great desire to live also, stroked afterburner and buzzed out of the area with no authorization for us to engage lethally at that time. Concurrent with that, I was in an F-14 pressing into one of the surface-to-air missiles launch authorized areas. In international waters, well off the coast of Libya, well outside of 12 miles, but well inside the SA-5 launch acceptable region. In the F-14, as well as other aircraft, and I look out in the audience because I know there's former aviators out here, we have uh, electronic surveillance measures in the aircraft. And the electronic service surveillance measures allow you to listen to the radars and the missiles that are transmitting very specific electronic signals. And specifically in your own aircraft, you can determine what type of radar is tracking you, what type of radar is searching the area, whether a missile has been launched at you, and if it's an active missile with an active radar on that missile, whether that radar in that missile is locked onto your aircraft, you get very specific signals with respect to those types of detections. So in my F-14, my mission was, and it had a very specific code name at the time, it was called Blue Darter, to dart into the launch acceptable region of the SA-5 to see if the Libyans truly had resolve, to see if they would launch their SA-5. And the Libyans did have resolve. And they did launch their SA-5. And I am here to tell you that the SA-5 is a very impressive surface-to-air missile. It stands nearly 40 feet tall. I think of it almost as an Apollo. Uh, it has a 500-pound warhead. Uh, it has a speed nearly a Mach 5. But the SA-5 is designed specifically to go for high altitude targets, up to 100,000 feet. And I was not at 100,000 feet. You could see the SA-5 launch at range, probably about 35 miles, 40 miles. Uh, very bright burn. Uh, launches, as you would imagine, a, uh, a NASA launch. It goes straight up. But the SA-5 flight profile is to go to altitude, then to tip toward the target of intent and guide to the target of intent from a high altitude, come down on the target. So the defeat of the SA-5 was uh, rather typical, go to low altitude, wave top level, leave the area, uh, the SA-5 would not engage. But the importance of that mission was that was, in fact, a hostile act. The Libyans fired upon us. We did not fire upon them, and it was in international waters. Concurrent to the SA-5 launch, the Libyans sent one of their corvettes and two of their fast patrol missile boats toward the Ticonderoga. The battle had begun. The U.S response was going to be measured. So the tally at the end of the day, as we return fire to the launching surface-to-air missile sites and also to the Corvette and a couple of the uh, fast patrol boats, again the Libyans came up on the short end and the U.S. did a measured response. Not in hostility, again in international waters. The battle was over, or not. The carrier battle group left the area. We were in the area for several days. The, uh, the Saratoga detached to go home. The Midway in the America uh, went to the northern Mediterranean. We'd been at sea for a couple of months uh, on our respective carriers. A little bit of rest and relaxation. One carrier pulled into Italy, another into Cannes, France. Spent several days uh, before we were to go back out to sea. Muammar Gaddafi realized that he had 
heightened the game significantly and again came up on the short end. His response was not a military response, it was a terrorist response. So many of you may remember uh, the bombing event in West Germany, April 1986. It was a uh, nightclub that was favored by Americans, but truly a lot of multinational visitors. A uh, bomb goes off, there were two American soldiers were killed, uh, one Greek young woman was killed, there were over 200 individuals that were injured, and the intelligence antennas went up very quickly. Who could have been the cause of this horrendous event? West German and U.S. intelligence collectors determined it was East Germany and Libya. They had communications very clearly orchestrating, authorizing, and then conducting the bombing event. And now it's time for a U.S. measured response again. So now, code name Operation El Dorado. Two aircraft carriers, the America, the Coral Sea. The Air Force also engaged. The timing is going to be an airstrike. It's going to be an airstrike only, and it's going to be a measured response. And the strike date is April the 15th. We knew that a week prior. We in the carrier battle group did not designate the targets. The President's Security Council chose the targets. We had many battle plans. At the time, I was a, a mission commander, and we had a number of battle plans also, but we were given this operation, code name El Dorado Canyon, and exactly how it would be orchestrated a week prior to the strike. This was going to be the largest confrontation. It was not a strike of retaliation, it was a measured response. And it probably holds two records, as indicated there. The entire military strike lasted 12 minutes. Phenomenal. Phenomenal, as I give you more details, that the coordination required striking aircraft that were thousands of miles apart to arrive at precisely within seconds of the strike time. Also, as a result of those aircraft from thousands of miles away, it perhaps holds a record for the military operation that has the highest ratio of supporting aircraft to attacking aircraft. There were five tankers, surveillance aircraft, other supporting aircraft to every one strike aircraft that went feet dry into Libya. Phenomenal. So here we go. Let's set up the mission. It's going to be a two-pronged strike. The Air Force is going to strike targets in the Tripoli area. The Navy is going to strike targets on the other side of the line of death very specific targets, five specific target areas. The objectives hit terrorist facilities. We had very good intelligence that the Libyans were conducting not only terrorist activities on shore, but they also had an underwater, a submarine terrorist training cap. This is for planting mines on ships in harbor. It's for laying mines at harbor entries. It was for sabotaging either military ships or cargo ships. They had a very sophisticated underwater training camp. So we were to hit not only their land-based and land training camp, but also their underwater training facility. Also, the military air transport aircraft that transported their terrorists and also supporting military groups. Also thought it might be a good idea to neutralize some of the fighter and attack aircraft. And then the bottom line, maybe send a message to Colonel Muammar Gaddafi. Maybe leave a calling card at his headquarters would be a good idea also. So those were the targets of interest. And as you see in the bottom of the slide, where the particular targets were. The UK hosted the Air Force's F-111s. The America and the Coral Sea were sitting 100 miles off the coast. The plan was a coordinated attack, launching the F-111s out of the UK, having them transit to the Mediterranean, be in position for a strike that would take place 
on the moonless night of April the 15th at 2 a.m. in the morning. Coordinated. A 12-minute strike. To get from the UK to Libya, to draw a straight line, if you know your geography, you cross over. France, our buddies, our pals. So we did a cross-nation flight request, and guess what the French said? No, thank you. Not across our nation. As a result, the F-111s flying out of the UK had to fly south through the Atlantic, come through the Straits of Gibraltar. They added over a thousand miles to their transit to get to Libya. Required several tankings, KC-135s, numerous of them, had to supply fuel for the F-111s to get them all the way to Libya. Actually, the same KC-135s were flying today. Think back, this is 22 years ago. Long, long flight. And in fact, to support the operation, look at the tally of the U.S. aircraft. There were 18 F-111s as principal strike aircraft. But the Air Force realized to get 18 aircraft actually to the target site, they would probably lose some mission capability. Engine loss, hydraulic failures, maybe some of the avionics, electronics on board. So they launched an additional six FB-111s as spares, airborne spares, that receive fuel tanking south of the Atlantic, through the Straits of Gibraltar, into the Eastern Mediterranean, refueled, received fuel, those six additional EF-111s or F-111s, before they returned back to the UK. Five EF-111s. These are electronic EF-111s. They have jamming equipment to shut down the radars for the surface the air launch missile systems in Libya. That's the mission for the EF-111s. And the 28 tanker aircraft. For the US Navy, 14 medium attack bombers. For my attack bomber, A6 buddies here in the audience, thank you very much. 12 A7s, 4 E2Cs. These are the command and control aircraft in the Navy. You may see uh, pictures of them with the ray domes, the circular ray domes on the top to provide the command and control while you're airborne. And then 8 F-14 air superiority fighters. The F-14s of that time did not have an attack a bombing capability. The F-14 was truly an air superiority fighter. Its purpose was to defend the battle group, defend the attack aircraft. It was an air superiority fighter. The F-14's mission for Operation El Dorado was to allow kicking down the front door of Libya, to allow the strike aircraft to enter, and then to absolutely shut the back door to prevent any Libyan aircraft from a counterattack, chasing down the retreating U.S. attacking aircraft, or attacking the battle group. So the F-14 had a mission to be there first, open the door, be there last, and in fact stay on scene to prevent any retaliation. Sixty tons of bombs were delivered on target that night to those very specific target areas. Not a single Libyan aircraft responded. Let me give you some of the details. As the U.S. Navy was responsible for attacking the Western Peninsula, and the U.S. Air Force was to attack the targets and did attack the targets in the Tripoli area, the F-14s provided the fighter escort for both attacks. The F-14s went in first. The F-14s went in at wave top on a moonless night to stay below the radar detection capability of the Libyan air defense missile system. We did not want to key or clue the Libyans that an attack was imminent. Interestingly enough, the Soviet advisors for Libya, as the Libyans had procured much Soviet equipment, had advised Muammar Gaddafi to go on high alert. The Soviets felt as though an attack was imminent. Muammar Gaddafi declined. Another point of interest, Muammar Gaddafi ordered his Air Force to stay on the ground. There is competing information and dialogue as to why that is, but my assessment, he knew he was outmatched. 
He knew that if he launched any of his aircraft, that the tally would be the U.S. many wins, the Libyans nothing. He knew he didn't have the air crew. He knew they didn't have the training. He knew he had the hardware, but he knew that he could not engage the U.S. and could not counter the air superiority capability the F-14 brought to the table, so he ordered his Air Force to stay on the ground. Not one aircraft took off. So here's the tally. U.S. lost one F-111. I saw the F-111 go down. I did not see it go down specifically. I saw a fireball. I wasn't quite sure what it was, but it was right off the coast. Uh, I was one of the ones that provided, uh, I would offer documentation that I did not believe that it was brought down by hostile fire, that it was well off the coast. Uh, the air crew, in fact, were recovered by the Libyans. One body of one of the Air Force officers was returned, I believe, in the late 80s, and there's still controversy because the Libyans are believed to still hold one of the other air crew members. The Libyans suffered pretty, uh, pretty significantly, but I would offer it was a measured response from the U.S. We took out a number of their air transport aircraft. We took out a Boeing 737. We thought that was good business for Boeing. Not really. Uh, they used that aircraft for military transport. Took out a number of the fighter aircraft that had been targeted. Took out a number of helicopters that had been targeted. Uh, took out a number of attack aircraft that had been targeted. The barracks for the training for the terrorist took those out also. Uh, a couple of bombs did go awry. In fact, we also damaged the French embassy. Uh, <laughs> now, that, think about this for a second, and it was, it was a bit of controversy. But the Air Force was denied over flight over France, and then one of their bombs kind of went astray and damaged the French embassy. The French didn't find that very amusing. Uh, a lot of apologies, letters going back and forth, but in any case, the French embassy was damaged. The line of death met its demise. There were no confrontations with respect to the line of death after that attack. The attack retreated. I would offer a little bit contrary to my first remark that in fact there were two fighters that did roll down one runway. And as I was keeping the back door closed with the AUG-9 radar, was able to actually track the aircraft as they were rolling down the runway. The aircraft did get airborne, two aircraft, two MiG-23s. They never left the airfield operating area. They turned around and landed immediately, a section of MiG-23s. I suspect they wanted some nighttime training at 2.05 a.m., uh, but in any case, they chose not to engage. Another point of interest, too, for the attack, uh, I was uh, protecting and, in fact, engaging the Tripoli target area. As we, the F-14 division went in at uh, very low altitude to stay below radar level, at the appointed time, the time for the strike, all based on time only, there was no radar or radio communications, we were, call, we were in what's called um, MCON, and this is to prevent any transmissions of any radios or radars from your aircraft that would otherwise clue uh, the threat, the enemy, that you were in the area. So there were no radar transmissions from our aircraft. There were no radio transmissions from our aircraft. We were in complete communication silence. At the appointed time, from an altitude of 50 feet, the F-14s off of Tripoli, as well as the F-14s that were off the peninsula to the west, climbed to altitude of 5,000 feet. The reason being is to announce our presence at the same time to have the surface-to-air radars detect the F-14s, which are sometimes referred to as aluminum clouds, very detectable by surface-to-air radars. The Libyan surface-to-air radars did, in fact, detect us very quickly. They locked onto us. The surface-to-air missiles were cued to us, the F-14s. This is part of kicking down the front door. But what we had with us, the F-14s, we had A-7s and A-6s, and F-18s that had high-speed anti-radiation missiles. And the mission of that harm, high-speed anti-radiation missile, 
They are tuned to very specific frequencies, the frequencies of a threat radar. And so as soon as those radars, the Libyan Air Defense System locked onto the F-14s, A-7s, A-6s, F-18s popped up with their harm missiles, launched to harm missiles, which honed in on the radars high speed and very effectively taking out the radar sites. What I thought was interesting was after those high speed missiles engaged, the Libyans with my own board radar detection system I have on board, I was able to notice the radar shut down. Either they were shut down by damage or they were shut down intentionally because the operators knew that they were under attack also. After the attack, we have reports from the Soviets, as well as our own intelligence, that indicated both happened. That in fact, our missiles were very effective in taking out a lot of the missile sites that engaged us. But also the Iranians, which were 3,000 strong, I'm sorry, the Libyans, which were 3,000 strong in personnel operating the air defense system, many of them abandoned their sites. Abandoned their sites. There were Soviet advisors in Libya that were appalled that the Libyans had the Soviet equipment. The Soviets were absolutely, I would offer, looking forward to this engagement to show the ability of Soviet technology versus American capability. And the Libyans left their stations. Again, a point of training. So, the retreat happens. A couple of MiG-23s launch. They land. But then after the radar sites had been shut down, there were a lot, and I mean a lot, of surface-to-air missiles and AAA fired. And the Americans were out of the operating area. And for those of you that recall, back uh, post the engagement, April the 16th, April the 17th, and the reports of all the collateral damage in downtown Tripoli, I submit that what the Libyans did is they suffered much, the majority of the damage, that was civilian damage, at their own hand, because they were launching missiles and anti-aircraft fire, unguided. It was almost like a 4th of July event, to watch the missiles go up, but then you could see the missiles returning back into the city and exploding. Uh, and that was after the U.S. had retreated. F-14s remained off the coast for another half an hour, 45 minutes. Again, no activity. We backed off the coast another 50 miles, no activity. Backed off to 100 miles, no activity. We were relieved on station by backup F-14s to continue that mission in preparation for retaliation, no retaliation. We stayed on scene for several more days, still no activity from the Libyans, and so we departed the area. So the aftermath. World reaction was mixed. French didn't appreciate our presence, but as with many of these engagements, some were in favor of the U.S. response, some were against the U.S. response. Muammar Gaddafi's terrorist acts that were specifically so focused to the U.S. significantly reduced. In fact, went away with one exception, the Pan Am bombing, which you may be familiar with. In fact, as you go down the slides here, uh, it was in 1999 that Muammar turned over the agents which intelligence, international intelligence, indicated were responsible for the Pan Am 103 bombing, where Libyan citizens were in Libya uh, Muammar Gaddafi turned them over to international courts in 1999. In 2002, and I think the dates are rather interesting too, this is after 9-11, uh, Muammar Gaddafi, Colonel Gaddafi, decides the Al-Qaeda is probably not a good terrorist group, and so he opposes the Al-Qaeda. He becomes even more aligned to the U.S. and to Western interest. He, in fact, writes a letter to the U.N. admitting responsibility to the Pan Am 103 bombing. He compensates the families for the Pan Am 103 bombing. He denounces his own nuclear program after that. And then just recently, the Eastern European nations as well as the U.S. lifted our trade embargoes against Libya. And we have started to trade with Libya. So it's interesting what 22 years will do. And to that, the line of death that was born in 1973 truly did meet its demise in 1986 and is gone.
That concludes my lecture. And in fact, I don't quite know how Cindy would like to do this, but uh, there's a lot of you, there's several of you here in the audience that I know were part of the mission, affiliated with the mission, and also have F-14 experience and others. So I would open the floor to questions if you're interested, or if there's something I said controversial or you think is an error, I challenge me. Yes, sir. Ah, a good point. The question, there was an engagement in 1989 also. And uh, this was, again, 2v2 on fighters. And the result in U.S. two wins and the Libyans zero. It was another engagement, and for the purpose of brevity, I kept it out of my presentation. But it could have been one byline. And it was a very similar situation. Uh, again, the U.S. was exercising freedom of navigation, and we were engaged again. And as a result, and this is a point of interest too, maybe to some of you, in the history of the F-14, which has, a, a, I think, a very, very uh, remarkable history of nearly 32 years, the F-14 only shot down four other fighter aircraft, and they happen to be Libyan. Now, it could be argued that the U.S. spent a lot of money for the F-14s, and in fact, there were nearly 700 F-14s that were procured by the U.S. Navy uh, in their entirety. And there were only F-14s sold abroad to one nation. That was Iran. Uh, we sold 70 to Iran before the fall of the Shah. But I think the measure of the success of the F-14 isn't that it only shot down four aircraft. The measure of success is all the engagements it prevented. The F-14 was absolutely an air superiority fighter. No other aircraft in the world had the ability to reach out over 100 miles with great precision and not only shoot down one aircraft at that great range, but to engage six different aircraft simultaneously from one F-14. Awesome. And so the F-14s, again, its, its success was not the number of shoot downs, but I think the hostilities have prevented. But thank you for the question. Yeah, the question was about the abandonment of the Libyan surface-to-air missile sites, and what were the contributing factors with respect to that. And I submit twofold. One, and you could probably use any metaphor you like with respect to buying equipment and then being able to use the equipment. And I'll use the metaphor of a bicycle. Just because I can go out and buy a bicycle that's a $5,000 bicycle and it's a top racer, and I get on it, doesn't mean I'm going to compete as a top racer. Well, the Libyans procuring top of the line Soviet equipment and the Libyans being typically a nation that is a poor nation and a nation that typically does not have uh, an educational system and ability to train uh, as the US and other I would offer uh, nations. The Libyans just in my assessment didn't have the ability from a manpower perspective to understand the technology and understand the ability to operate a weapon system that wasn't even theirs. In fact, it was a Russian or a Soviet weapon system. And I suspect, I did not operate, but I suspect with a high level of confidence, if you were to review or look at the operating consoles of the Soviet surface-to-air missile systems, SA-2s, 3s, 5s, pick your SA, probably all the nomenclature was in Russian, I suspect. I suspect the displays were not Libyan-friendly, Russian-friendly. And so here you have a country that can procure the weapons to include the aircraft. They have individuals. And could you imagine you know, somebody coming knocking on your door and go, well, Jim, you know, it's such a deal I have for you. You're going to be a fighter pilot today. Or you're going to operate a surface-to-air missile system. Going to give you a good check. It's good for you. Serve the country. Such a deal I have for you. And you well, I've never done this before. I don't even have a high school education. Don't read Russian. Oh, but you're going to get a government check. So you go sit at your console, you jump in your trusty fighter, uh, and then you are faced with confrontation against the U.S. I think pretty daunting. And so I believe that the reason for the flight was, of the Libyans, twofold. Lack of training, lack of national commitment, and absolutely desire for preservation. 
But thank you for your question. And again, for the purpose of recording, for all the pilots that flew all those F-14, the air crews, what became of them when the F-14 retired, uh, all the above. Some of the air crew transitioned to F-18 E's and F's, which was the new and improved F-18. Uh, more bomb carrying capacity, bigger aircraft, longer range, better radar. Uh, some of the air crew were retirement age, and so they chose to retire. Some of them went into other careers within the Navy uh, besides transitioning to the F-18 ENF. Uh, so for the entire community, and let me offer too a point of discussion, the retirement of the F-14 was not 700 aircraft or 100 aircraft all at one time. It was a very phased retirement. Uh, the retirement of the squadrons began in the mid-90s, I would offer, going into the late 90s, as squadrons began to be retired, squadrons began to be retired, but there were also the presence of F-14 squadrons still in the community. So there was a very gradual retirement period over about a decade, and then the last two squadrons uh, were retired in the 2005-2006 time frame. Thank you for watching Peninsula Seniors Out and About. I'm Betty Wheaton. See you next time.